Do you see how they manufacture consent now? It's selective outrage and selective coverage. Manufacturing consent by Edward S. Herman and Noam Chomsky is probably the most influential book among online leftists. While the book was written in 1988, and while it's been incredibly important in certain circles since its publication, from what I can tell, it entered the online political zeitgeist just a few years ago. At this time, neither Noam Chomsky nor leftist literature were foreign to me. I had read Understanding Power by Chomsky, as well as other books like Thomas Frank's What What's the Matter with Kansas, during college and just after I graduated, but I had actually never heard of manufacturing consent until a few years ago. Now, I can't go a few days without hearing about it from one of the socialist hipster internet tabloids. I finally started to read the book for myself, and while I haven't gotten too far into it as of the writing of this video, from what I can tell so far, online leftists have not misrepresented its basic premise. As Herman and Chomsky write, it is our view that, among their other functions, the media serve and propagandize on behalf of the powerful societal interests that control and finance them. The representatives of these interests have important agendas and principles that they want to advance, and they are well positioned to shape and constrain media policy. This is normally not accomplished by crude intervention, but by the selection of right-thinking personnel, and by the editors and working journalists, internalization of priorities and definitions of newsworthiness that conform to the institution's policy. While they may not have said the words manufacturing consent until relatively recently, this logic was employed in critiques of the media that online leftists have always made. One of the through lines of books like Manufacturing Consent and What's the Matter with Kansas are the concepts of manipulation and misinformation. The people who read these books all seem to think that regular people, leftists excluded of course, are being fooled by some nefarious actors with their own agenda. If only people had the right information, they would see that leftists are fundamentally correct, and the people would embrace leftist policies, leftist values, and leftist candidates without apology. I find this all to be terribly condescending toward both regular people and journalists. The condescension towards regular people is obvious. Leftists believe they know what's in these people's best interests better than they do themselves. They're just being fooled, and it's up to the left to show them the truth. Again, we have a, a, a chunk of the population here that continuously votes against their best interests. And we have to get to the bottom of why that is. Why is that happening? I mean, obviously, there's misinformation. They're being misled. They're being manipulated. And it's frustrating because you try to give evidence and provide information about what's really going on to look out for them. And they reject it as elitist propaganda. And it's like, no, 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 what you've bought into is the propaganda. Well, the, part of the problem is that progressives actually care about uh, Americans. It would be less insulting to just call these people stupid. It's also condescending towards journalists to suggest that they're the unwitting mouthpieces for people far more powerful and more important than they are. We totally absolutely 100% without a doubt need to remake the media. We need to clean house and get people who are honest and who are truth tellers and who aren't captured by corporate interests or the military industrial complex. And don't get it twisted. It's not nefarious. I don't even think these people know that that's what they are. I think Jake Tapper's real opinions are hawkish. He's a liberal interventionist, which is why he says those things. But that's why he's on the air. That's why they pick him. So the real... Conspiracy and the real scandal is in the hiring process. Who are you going to pick? You're going to pick people who are not going to rock the boat, who are going to give the establishment narrative. It would be less insulting to just call them liars. While I don't accept most of this framework, I would never deny that the funding source of a media outlet doesn't have an effect on its coverage. In fact, I would argue that that's true of media that's crowdfunded as well. Nor would I deny that media bias has an effect on our politics. Again, I have only just begun the book, so it's possible that I'll be persuaded by the time I finish it. I guess we'll see. What I do know now is that manufacturing consent is used by online leftists the same way the right uses fake news or how they used to use liberal media. Manufacturing consent are two magic words that let you wish away news coverage you don't like. Did a candidate you like lose? Well, no worries. It was just because the media manufactured consent. Biden has won Arizona. Um, the whole primary is over. So um, uh, they, they ran uh, Bernie Sanders out of town. The mainstream media um, called him unelectable a thousand times. 
They and after Biden won uh, South Carolina and all the establishment Democrats united, and we didn't. Uh, it it was huge. When once Biden won Super Tuesday, it was still really close because Bernie Sanders won California, Colorado, uh, and 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 many other states, and he had won the biggest state in the union. But the media said it was over, 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 and everybody believed it. Is public opinion going in a direction you don't like? Well, that's just because people have been propagandized. Republican elites and right-wing media have convinced these people to not care about things that would actually improve their lives. They've convinced them, don't care about the $15 minimum wage. Don't care about unions. Don't care about getting everybody health care, including yourself. Don't care about ending the wars. That's what they've convinced them. That's what they've, they've convinced these people of. And that's unforgivable. You know, the brainwashers have succeeded. How Kyle Kalinske, aka Mr. Opinion Polls, can distinguish between public opinion that is the result of propaganda versus public opinion that's authentic, I do not know. And I would love to hear an explanation from him. The relationship that the online left has with the media is complicated and rife with contradictions. I've gone over some of them before, and I'll go over some of them in the future. But today, I want to talk about why I don't think manufacturing consent really matters. Again, it's not that how media is funded can't affect its coverage. I've already conceded that it can. What I mean is that I don't think the online left is actually concerned with media funding. However powerful you think the media is, and however much you think it affects politics, it can can't hold a candle to confirmation bias. And like pretty much everyone else, the online left evaluates the merits of media by whether or not it confirms their priors. Manufacturing consent is merely the rhetorical device they use to invalidate reporting they don't care for. In his essay, Science as Falsification, philosopher Karl Popper wrote, I found that those of my friends who were admirers of Marx, Freud, and Adler were impressed by a number of points in common to these theories, and especially by their apparent explanatory power. These theories appear to be able to explain practically everything that happened within the fields to which they referred. The study of any of them seemed to have the effect of an intellectual conversion or revelation. Open your eyes to a new truth hidden from those not yet initiated. Once your eyes were thus opened, you saw confirmed instances everywhere. The world was full of verification of the theory. Whatever happened always confirmed it. Thus its trust appeared manifest. And unbelievers were clearly people who did not want to see the manifest truth, who refused to see it either because it was against their class interest, or because of their repressions which were unanalyzed and crying aloud for treatment. The most characteristic element in the situation seems to me the incessant stream of confirmations, of observations that verified the theories in question, and this point was constantly emphasized by their adherents. A Marxist could not open a newspaper without finding on every page evidence for his interpretation of history, not only in the news, but also in its presentation, which revealed the class bias of the paper, and especially, of course, what the paper did not say. You see, once you believe that the world works a certain way, you see evidence supporting that worldview everywhere. I, I think I think when you read Marx, I, it, kind of, it kind of messes you up, right? Because when you read Marx and you understand how exploitation works um, and how capitalism works, it, it kind of screws you up and makes you realize like all the ways in which people get expo um, exploited and originally, like, I don't think I really realized it. I, like, it wasn't, I wasn't as conscious of it, right? So when, when I watched that documentary, as dorky as it might sound, I just apply Marx's theories <laughs> to it. And I think it's such an interesting documentary to see through that framework, you know? Um, and it just gives you a better understanding of like what actually went wrong. Again, this is how everyone thinks, me included. So when it comes to the media, whenever the online left encounters some sort of reporting they don't like, they put on the manufacturing consent goggles to see why it is that the outlet in question reported the information the way they did. This is especially evident when the online left talks about Afghanistan reporting. They see some story that is critical of the withdrawal, or at the very least discusses the negative fallout of the withdrawal, and they work their way backwards to establish media connections to defense contractors or some other bad actor, who of course want to remain in Afghanistan to increase their profits or enrich themselves in some other way. This guy works for a non-profit organization called the Institute for the Study of War. Oh, that sounds so official, right? It's headquartered here in Washington, D.C. Oh, they must be serious people. Uh, it's a non-profit, but you know who funds it? Raytheon, General Dynamics, and DynCorp. 
Interesting. So understand what Jack Keane's entire job is. His entire job is what he's doing right there. Go on TV, pretend to be a serious person with serious opinions, and always push for more war. Push for more war, push for more bombing, push for more ground invasions, because that's who he gets paid by, the people who create the weapons, who then need those weapons to be used so they can create even more weapons. This is the military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned about. As I'll say for the third time now, I would never suggest that such relationships couldn't affect news coverage. What I will argue, though, is that this is an example of selective skepticism. We could easily do this to talking points that leftists repeat, and the left could easily do this to reporting they actually like. They simply choose not to. In a recent video, I discussed the fallacy of believing that America's presence in Afghanistan had something to do with the mineral wealth there. The people regurgitating this talking point likely got it from a 2010 report, which said that Afghanistan could be the Saudi Arabia of lithium. Weirdly, this report was issued even though people have known about Afghanistan's potential mineral wealth since the 1970s. So why restate something like this in 2010? Well, there is one theory that has to do with the state of the Afghanistan war at the time. Just a few months prior, the Afghan president, Hamid Karzai, fired his intelligence and interior ministers. After his forced resignation, Amrullah Saleh, the intelligence minister, did an interview with the New York Times where he said that Karzai no longer believed that the West could win the war, and that the Afghan government would be better off casting its lot with Pakistan and the Taliban. Karzai also apparently asked the UN to take Mullah Omar, a Taliban leader, off of its blacklist. We also found out right before the release of this memo that Pakistan's intelligence agency, Inter-Service Intelligence, or ISI, was deeply involved with the Afghan Taliban. The London School of Economics Development Studies Institute released a report titled The Sun in the Sky, detailing the relationship. As Foreign Policy Magazine reported at the time, the report details the ISI's close relationship with the Taliban and its involvement with the Qaeda Shura, along with claims from Taliban commanders that the ISI is heavily involved with the planning and execution of attacks on schools and other government targets in Afghanistan. In short, the ISI, an important part of the Pakistan army, is hoodwinking the United States by still heavily supporting the Taliban movement in order to ensure that they have a permanent voice in deciding the future of Afghanistan. Given that Pakistan was supposed to be an ally in the fight against the Taliban, this was not a good look. So the war effort was not looking good at this point in time. There was already a lot of clamoring for the United States to withdraw, and given that the cause seemed hopeless on many fronts, the people who wanted to stay were not in a good position. And then, out of the blue, this game changer of a report drops. There are potentially trillions of dollars of mineral wealth in Afghanistan. Surely this, if anything, justifies a military presence there. Well, as I argued in my last video, there wasn't a whole lot there there when it came to this supposed discovery. Feel free to watch that video if you haven't already. And I suppose I should note here that this rather suspect memo came from the Pentagon and was reported on uncritically by the New York Times. Blake Hounshell over at Foreign Policy Magazine was one of the people who expressed skepticism in the timing of the report. Don't get me wrong, he wrote, this could be a great thing for Afghanistan which certainly deserves a lucky break after the hell it's been through over the last three decades. But I'm A, skeptical of this $1 trillion figure, B, skeptical of the timing of the story, given the bad news cycle, and C, skeptical that Afghanistan can really figure out a way to develop these resources in a useful way. So, is it possible that the Pentagon released this report in an attempt to move public opinion in the direction of Stain, as some people suggested at the time? Well, we do know that General David Petraeus said at the time that there is stunning potential here. There are lots of ifs, of course, but I I think potentially it is hugely significant. We do know that generals tend to favor military action and try to persuade reluctant presidents in that direction. And we know that Petraeus himself once talked about putting a little more time on the Washington clock for the Afghanistan surge as a means of a public relations strategy. So was the Pentagon manufacturing consent in an effort to keep America in Afghanistan longer? I don't know. What I do know is that Kyle has said that the mainstream media just repeats what the military and intelligence agencies tell them uncritically. A lot of these reporters just serve reporters, just serve as stenographers to their sources at the CIA and the Pentagon. 
That might be literally what happened here. When Kyle talks about Afghanistan's mineral wealth, he might just be unwittingly repeating Pentagon talking points. Ironically, the reason why he's doing this is because he has a different interpretation of these facts than the alleged propagandists do. He believes that one of the guiding forces of American foreign policy is the theft of natural resources. So we're illegally occupying a sovereign country and jacking their natural resources, and... None of the conservatives wanted to impeach him over withdrawing from Afghanistan think there's a problem with that. So in other words, they're all imperialists. Hey, we think it's our right to do whatever we want, wherever we want around the world, and steal anybody's stuff. That's what we can do. So he just repeats this point without a hint of skepticism. Kyle could have easily put on the manufacturing consent goggles and worked his way backwards to discredit these talking points about Afghanistan's mineral wealth. He simply chooses not to, because it fits neatly into his worldview, albeit for different reasons. Here's another example of online leftists selectively believing the media that I like even better. Back in June, Eli Rosenberg of the Washington Post wrote an article about how businesses are dealing with a worker shortage. The title of the article is pretty self-explanatory. These businesses found a way around the worker shortage, raising wages to $15 an hour or more. Rosenberg interviewed the owners and workers of a dozen businesses across the country and came back with glowing stories about how so many of their problems were solved by increasing wages. Rosenberg begins by profiling an ice cream parlor in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which was short on frontline staff. The job posting for scoopers, $7.25 an hour plus tips, did not produce a single application between January and March. So owner Jacob Honshar decided to more than double the starting wage to $15 an hour plus tips, just to see what would happen. The shop was suddenly flooded with applications. More than 1,000 piled in over the course of a week. It was like a dam broke, Honchar said. Media coverage that followed his decision soon pushed other candidates his way. The Washington Post all but advocated for the universalization of this approach in policy. The experience of 12 business operators interviewed by the Washington Post who raised their minimum wage in the last year points to another element of the equation. The central role that pay, specifically a $15 an hour minimum starting wage, plays in attracting work right now. Were there trade-offs? Sure. Some of the businesses had to increase prices on their products, but overall, the benefits outweighed the costs. The business operators spoke about the challenges associated with increased labor costs, with three saying they had to raise prices on consumers. One of those, as well as the two that did not raise prices, said they had to reduce some seasonal staffing or staff hours to make up for the cost. Overall, the article portrayed the wage increase as overwhelmingly positive, though. For Patrick Whalen, co-owner of the Fifth Street Group, comprising five restaurants in Charleston and Charlotte, the breaking point came late in March. The restaurants were getting busier as more people started venturing out to eat. But applicants for dozens of positions the company was trying to hire were scarce. And then Whalen decided to raise wages. Applicants began pouring in nearly overnight, Whalen said. Within three weeks, the restaurant group went from about 50 to 60% staffed to nearly fully staffed. There is no one in Charleston or Charlotte that can compete with what my guys are making, Whalen said. So, how did Crystal Ball and Kyle Kalinske react to the story? Pretty much exactly as you'd expect. Fifteen dollar uh, wage has apparently become the answer. Surprise, surprise, to uh, businesses that are having trouble getting workers. Turns out, Kyle, according to the Washington Post, that when you pay people a living wage, they actually want to work for you. Yeah, I, I have to say, I'm just happy that they're actually reporting that fact. They have a couple of good. I mean, you know, we love Jeff Stein. They have a couple of good economics reporters over at the Washington Post. I will say this was an example of surprisingly good journalism. The thing is, if you wanted to put on the manufacturing consent goggles and read motives into this article, you could easily do that. Who owns the Washington Post? Jeff Bezos, the richest man alive who started Amazon. Progressives love pointing this out whenever the Washington Post reports something they don't like. This is the Washington Post. This is the this is the paper everyone oh it's the paper of no everyone loves the Washington Post. It's owned by a, it's owned by an eighty billionaire predatory capitalist. What could be wrong? Who has a six hundred million dollar deal to see? Well, I don't see a problem. But now they don't seem to think that this is relevant. Well, those of you who watch this channel know that it is. Amazon is currently lobbying the federal government to increase the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour. We believe that fifteen dollars an hour is the minimum anyone in the U.S. should be paid for an hour of labor. Jay Carney, Amazon's senior vice president of global corporate affairs, wrote in a blog in late January. We also believe that it's good for business. 
and when Jay Carney says it's good for business, there are good reasons to believe that he means it's good for the business he works for at the expense of its competitors. I've talked about this at length in a video before. Feel free to watch that if you feel so inclined. So why didn't Crystal and Kyle put on the manufacturing consent goggles, play connect the dots, and conclude that the Washington Post is writing a glowing story about raising wages when the owner of the newspaper wants exactly that policy implemented to benefit his much more profitable business? Eli Rosenberg may not be deliberately doing propaganda for Amazon, but surely he was hired by his superiors because they knew that he would write these sorts of stories. Right? Crystal and Kyle don't come to this conclusion because they like the idea of a $15 an hour minimum wage. So they accept reporting that favors that policy uncritically. Manufacturing consent in practice is just the online left selectively casting dispersion on reporting they don't like. When the news media says something they disapprove of, it's proof that the corporate media is manufacturing consent. When the very same media says something they do like, it's an example of good journalism. These people may as well stick their fingers in their ears and shout, nuh uh, whenever they come across information they don't like. Now, do I think that Eli Rosenberg is just the pawn in some elaborate scheme to manufacture consent in favor of a given policy? No, I wouldn't say that. In fact, I believe that the Washington Post is honestly reporting the results they found. Of course, none of that proves that a $15 an hour minimum wage is good policy to apply to every single business in America. And this is another reason why I don't think manufacturing consent really matters. Good journalism is good journalism regardless of where it comes from. Bad journalism is bad journalism regardless of where it comes from. It's on the consumer to think critically and distinguish between the two. And unfortunately for some, wishing away reporting that doesn't confirm your priors by saying manufacturing consent doesn't accomplish that. Mm.